This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Welcome everybody to this uh, seminar, uh, Gender and History. Gender, oh, I get this wrong all the time. Try me, help me. Gender and History in the Americas. In the Americas, that's it, mm-hmm. seminar. Um, and uh, it is rare that I have the opportunity to introduce a scholar of this calibre. Um, so we are uh, going to hear tonight from uh, Professor Annette Gordon-Reed on women, slavery and Monticello. Uh, Professor Gordon-Reed comes to us from Harvard via Oxford, um, where uh, I've had to write down all of your affiliations because my memory's not great. Uh, where, uh, so, at Har- uh, so she is the Carol K. Uh, Fortzheimer Professor at Radcliffe Institute for, for Advanced Study. Uh, she's also the Charles Warren Professor of American Legal History at Harvard Law School. Um, her background is in legal training and she came through to history via Thomas Jefferson, who I presume will feature at some point in today's talk. Mm-hmm. Um, she's also a Professor of History at Harvard University, um, where she's been since 2010. Mm-hmm. Um, and is currently the uh, Harold Vivian Harmsworth Visiting Professor of American History at uh, Queen's College, Oxford, uh, which is a position she will hold from 2015 to 2014 to 2015. Um, her work on Thomas Jefferson uh, has positioned her as one of the foremost presidential scholars in the United States. Um, I don't think it's an understatement to say that she's revolutionized her understanding of the relationships between um, slaves and the families that held them. Um, uh, her book in 1997, her first book in 1997, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, an American Controversy, was indeed controversial and cooks up quite a storm, uh, which uh, followed it for several years afterwards. Um, her, uh, she followed this up in 2001 with Vernon Can Read, a memoir uh, with the American civil rights uh, activist Vernon Jordan Jr. Um, and then back to Monticello in 2008 with the Hemingses of Monticello, an American family, uh, for which she received the National Book Award and the 2009 Pulitzer Prize in History. Uh, her latest work um, uh, on Andrew Johnson was a biography of the president, um, and uh, her forthcoming, I think you're still working on this, is mm-hmm. that correct? Mm-hmm. With Peter Onuf, uh, The Most Blessed of Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of Imagination. Um, she is the recipient of the National Humanities Medal. Uh, she is uh, a MacArthur Fellow and recently was elected Fellow, well not recently, it was 2011 was it? Mm-hmm. Uh, elected Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, so she's going to talk to us today about women, slavery and Monticello. Mm-hmm. Um, and with all of that said, I will look forward to Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, very, and thank you very much for coming out on a really beautiful day in London. <laughs> I was in London. This is the second time I've been in London in the past three days, and both times were fabulous, great weather. I had just come back from the United States for, I, I was there for several days, and it was two degrees Fahrenheit and about three feet of snow on the ground, about six feet of snow on the ground, and it's snowing again today, so I came to England for good weather, <laughs> which you don't usually typically think of. I was thinking, been thinking a lot about what I wanted to talk about today. I had the experience of rereading the novel Jane Eyre for the first time since I was in high school, and saw it in a different light than I'd seen it when I was in high school, and started thinking about the story and thinking about the mad woman in the attic, his wife who's shut away in the attic uh, while he um, courts Jane Eyre, and came to the Wide Sargasso Sea, which is a novel that was written um, to sort of counter as to tell the story of Mr. Rochester's wife, who's the, the mad woman who is locked in the attic and a person who was from the Caribbean um, he had met while he was down there sort of as an adventurer in the Caribbean to actually to marry her as an arranged marriage. And the book talks about slavery and talks about race and talks about all the kinds of things that uh, Charlotte Bronte obviously would not have talked about when she mentions the, uh, the Caribbean and his time there. And I <coughs> got the book, ordered the book, but also decided to download a copy of the movie, The Wide Sargasso Sea, and which is an interesting film. Didn't I evidently didn't go very far in terms of, you know, sales or whatever, but 
the depiction of the women in the, I haven't read the book yet, it's still on its way, but in the movie struck me um, as not problematic, but I sort of wondered how people would see it. There's a character in there who ends up seducing and sort of flirting with the, the husband, the plantation owner, and at one point they actually have sex. Uh, after he um, actually have sex and he gives her money and she says she is going to use this money to go to Rio. How she's going to get to Rio, I'm not really sure, but she thinks you know, she's going to get to Rio and there are lots of rich men there and that's how she's going to make her way. And I thought that I sort of assumed that the depiction, even though this wasn't a hit movie or anything like that, I wondered what the response would be to the presentation of an enslaved woman first flirting with this guy um, and then having sex with this guy and him giving her money and her saying that, yes, I'm going to take this money, I'm going to go to Rio. And there were not a lot of reviews of the film, but one of them talked about uh, this particular character and talked about her agency, this notion of her agency, that she, you know, it was a problematic scene, but it was okay because she'd taken the money and she said that she was going to go to Rio. So this turns out to be sort of a good thing that's happened. It's presented as something that's okay, whereas um, most people would look at that and see that as exploitative, um, but the sort of silver lining in it was that she got money out of it and she was going to Rio and was going to make a life for herself, even though she says, also indicates that it's going to be through her relationships with men. And it made me think about what brought me back to the work that I do and something that I would like to, to write about. I've written about it before, but write about them just in a concentrated way. Uh, the women who, enslaved women who are associated with Monticello, with Jefferson and Monticello. And how their lives show the special problems, the special, um, well, the special problems that that women faced during slavery. People think about, you know, obviously being made to work for no pay. People think a lot about sexual exploitation, uh, the loss of children, the, the commodification of women's bodies. All those kinds of things are definitely there. But when I was writing the book. Uh, the Hemings is a Monticello, and writing about people as individuals, I had to think about how I was going to present their lives, and I'm still writing about the Hemings family, be doing another volume uh, about the Hemings family, about how these women went through the world and how their relationships with men shaped um, the the trajectory of their families' lives. And we start out with the woman who is unknown, whose name is unknown, who was the mother of Elizabeth Hemings, who all that we know about her is from the <clears throat> recollections of Madison Hemings, who was a son of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, that she was a woman who was the, um, uh, the daughter of, she was an African woman, that his grandmother, uh, Elizabeth Hemings, was the daughter of an African woman and an English ship captain. We don't really know whether she was born in Africa or whether she was just of African extraction. Um, she would have, Elizabeth Hemings was born in 1735, and the 1730s, we do know, was sort of the high point for the importation of African people into Virginia uh, during that particular decade. So she could well, in fact, have been African. And in the memoir, he says, uh, she may have been a native of that country, speaking of Africa as a country, but of that particular land is what he means. Um, so we have this person who is you know, an African woman who has either raped by, most likely raped by that. So you think of, uh, we could talk about that. I mean, the question of how do you characterize connections between African American women or African women and, and white males. But it's different because this particular captain wanted to claim his child and was unable to claim his child because the person who owned Elizabeth's mother refused to sell the child or give the man the child. So we have this strange situation where you have a father 
who has a connection to an African woman, who has a child and actually wants to claim the child, but cannot own the child because Virginia followed part of sequitur ventrum, that you were what your mother was. And which is another thing that has defined the experience of African American women, that they were the people who were the transmitters of, of slavery, of the slave condition. Whether the man was white or black, it didn't matter. So you are what your mother is. Uh, which had been a uh, switch from the rule that had existed uh, in England, was what people came over the Atlantic with, uh, the notion that you were what your father was. And you can think about how much, more, how much easier, why that's a good rule for slavery and for the kind of plantation system that they were setting up, where um, you can control the sexuality of women was much more under control than that than the sexuality of males. Uh, women were much more restricted. Um, and you could, yes, and you could get the increase. You could benefit economically from the increase uh, that came from uh, uh, the pregnancies of uh, and um, the childbearing of African, of African, enslaved African American women in much the same way as you as, as the owner of cattle would, or a horse would, would own that child. And so she, Elizabeth Hemings' family, Elizabeth Hemings' life was determined by that because her mother was a slave, she was a slave. So we have Elizabeth Hemings, a mixed race woman in the household of a man who, after three of his wives die, decides that he is going to take Elizabeth Hemings as a concubine. Again, this is the story that's told by Madison Hemings, and he uses the word concubine to describe his, his grandmother, uh, her situation with John Wales. And he uses it to describe it with his mother as well. And people have asked me, and you know what, and I had to talk about, and to think about what does that mean that he uses the word concubine? What does it mean that he refers to his, um, you know, his grandmother his, or his grandfather as having taken his grandmother as a concubine and had six children with her, uh, the youngest of whom was uh, Sarah Hemings or Sally Hemings. And he says um, that his mother became Mr. Jefferson's concubine while they are in Paris. Is that, is it just a, a is there is any significance to the different characterization of those things, the use of the word concubine? What does it mean? To most people today, when you think of concubines, you think of some of a biblical times almost. Um, you know, a person has, King Solomon has, you know, 50 wives and a thousand concubines or something like that. Uh, and women who are used for purely sexual purposes, um, they have no uh, legal connection uh, to, no legal rights, their children have no legal rights. Uh, that's the thinking of the word concubine, that it, it, it's, there's no connection between the person, no affective connection between uh, the people. Um, and I wonder about this, and we can, we can talk about this, because you, you, you will be asking me questions, right, obviously, after this is over. Um, what does that actually mean? Um, does it necessarily mean that there is no affective connection? Does an affective connection matter uh, in the context of slavery? What could it possibly mean in the context of slavery? So we have Elizabeth Hemings, who, after a mixed race woman, becomes or is the concubine of John Wales, can't figure out, we know very little about John Wales, know very little about what that connection was like, um, except that when Jefferson marries John Wales's legal white daughter, Martha, um, and when he dies three years after the marriage, Elizabeth Hemings and her family become under the ownership of Jefferson. And so even before they are married, actually, you look at Jefferson's memorandum books and you see him giving money to the children of Elizabeth Hemings, you know, for finding him a mockingbird, for tips, for various things like that. He gives so right off the bat, because of her connection to this particular man, um, and probably more because she has children who are blood relatives of Jefferson's wife, Elizabeth Hemings' children are placed in a different situation than other enslaved people. 
um, in Jefferson's eyes. So when John Wales dies, Elizabeth Hemings and all of her children and 135 other enslaved people come under the ownership of Jefferson. She moves them into, Martha moves them into uh, position as her favored maids, household uh, slaves. They are not the people who are out in the fields. The Hemings women don't go to the fields. And so you have these women who are, because of their mixed race status, because of their genetic connection to uh, the master, they are constructed as a long, more akin to white women than akin to enslaved people. Um, the person who has the legal ownership over them and legal control over them thinks, that, that, that is to say Jefferson, thinks that women in the fields, uh, that women are not supposed to be in the fields, even though African-American women are in the fields. He comes to France and he sees women working in the fields and he says, ah, oh, this is terrible. He looks at Native Americans and says, they make their women go to the fields. Isn't that awful? I mean, when people are civilized, or he uses the phrase, at ease, women come into the home and work in the home. They do the cooking, the sewing, those kinds of things. They don't do hard work. So, of course, the question becomes, how are you riding through, you know, um, the fields in, in, um, in Europe and in Paris, outside of Paris, and see women in the fields and get offended by that, you are sending women to the fields. What about those women? And he just com he completely, he never talks about that. He immediately, when he's talking about these uh, uh, European peasants, goes over to sp start speaking about the Native American situation and how they're mistreating women, not how he's mistreating African-American women in his fields. So, and thinking, one of the things this book that, uh, that I'm working on right now uh, with my friend Peter Onuf is to sort of show how Jefferson um, justifies, rationalizes, um, reasons away some of the contradictions that exist in, in his own world. And part of the way he does it is that the people, the closest around to him are Elizabeth Hemings and her daughters and Elizabeth Hemings and her sons. And he sees slavery through his connection to these particular people. They're, you know, the stuff that he does for them, the way he takes these women and takes them out of the fields, doesn't let them in. At harvest time at Monticello, everybody, artisans, you know, whatever, everybody pitched in in the fields except the Hemings women. So because, again, of their genetic connection to his family and to his wife, they see themselves, they are treated as, and I don't, we don't have, well, from their behavior, it's pretty clear that they see themselves as a caste apart or different from other enslaved women. And this has sort of a, I think, a, you know, it, it works in relationship to one another. He treats them differently. They think of themselves as different. And that kind of cycle continues um, because of, of um, as I said, because of their, their genetic connection to, to, uh, to Jefferson. So Elizabeth Hemings and her daughters play this role at Monticello that makes them, that takes them outside of what we typically think of as well, as what we know was the other the experience of other enslaved people at Monticello. So when Martha dies, these are the women who are around her bedside um, upon her death. They take care of her uh, when she's dying, and they are the ones who repeat the story or tell the story about Jefferson um, promising his wife that he will never marry again. Um, and there, the I mean, that story is often told in Jefferson biographies, and nobody sort of acknowledges where that comes from. Uh, the person who transmits it is a white overseer, but the white overseer very clearly says, the Hemings women, these are the women who told me that this is what happened because they were there. So they contribute to a story about Jefferson that is generally accepted without people thinking about the source of that, where this actually came from, and that's because of their intimate connection to him. So 
right from the, from the moment they come to the mountain and Jefferson begins to treat them differently, uh, we go to a, it's pretty much clear that when he goes to France, he is going to take some, that members of those family with him, and he actually does do that. And it is in France that Sally Hemings, who is at the time 14 years old when she goes over, you know, ends up at the Hotel de Langeac with Jefferson. And it's an interesting, I mean, it, it, I, I try to use this story and think about um, this situation to illustrate the other vulnerability, well, the complete vulnerability of African American women, enslaved women. When Jefferson asks to have his daughter brought over, he says, send her with um, a Negro woman, a careful Negro woman, such as Isabel. Isabel Hearn, at this point, is about 28 years old. And he's the one he wants sent over uh, with, with his daughter. But he said, she must come, some woman must accompany her. And right there, it's clear, this, she's nine years old, almost 10 years old, and he doesn't want his daughter crossing the ocean without supervision and without female supervision because he wants somebody, obviously, to, to be a chaperone, to look after her. And Sally Hemings is drafted to do this, even though, as I said, she's about 14 years old. Uh, when she gets there, the captain of the ship decides that he wants to, that she's too young. He just says, you know, well, she's too young to look after this girl. I'm going to take her back to Virginia with me. And, you know, the first time I read that, I thought, that's kind of an interesting thing for him to decide on his own that you know the, the person who has been designated as the nursemaid uh, isn't qualified to do this so he's going to take her back to Virginia and I suggest that there you know in that there's something a little untoward about that because Jefferson obviously did not want his daughter to go over unchaperoned how safe could it have been for 14 maybe 15 year old girl at this point to spend six or seven weeks on an ocean voyage with a bunch of sailors by herself on the way back to Virginia and I said that and I got some criticism from people who said well you are making assumptions about Captain Ramsey that may not be fair and I was thinking well <laughs> you know what is more important you know Thinking about, you have to think about the vulnerability. How could I not think about the vulnerability of Sally Hemings? Why is Captain Ramsey's quote unquote reputation more important than trying to illustrate the difficulty, what that situation would, could be like, could possibly be like for a teenage girl on a ship with a bunch of sailors, you know, who, so a, uh, an enslaved woman who doesn't have the status uh, that Jefferson's daughter would have had had she been sent over. So thinking about that, th that, I mean, writing the history of enslaved women means that you have to think about things that others don't. I mean, you have to think about them in a different way without people who don't have power uh, to, you know, to sort of stave off attacks, stave, to have people respect them. That has to be a part of the thinking as well. And even if it means sometimes that you have to, I don't know, cast aspersions is too strong a word, but to see the possibility that the captain may not have been uh, wholly innocent in this, what I think is pretty extraordinary suggestion, uh, this is the kind of thing that you have to do. So, so there's that vulnerability on the ship, but we also have to think about the Hotel de Langeac. There she is, you have an enslaved girl in a household with no chaperone. If you think about, if anybody has a, uh, a daughter or think about you know, yourself as a, remember yourself as a teenager or, or nieces or, that you may have, you know, what would it be like to send a teenage girl to live with a middle-aged man with no chaperone? Can we just say how old Jackson is? He's 44. He's 44. He's 30, 30 years older. All right. So, a 14 year old, 14, 15 year old girl, she's there for about three years, um, just under three years, girl, 
living in a house with a middle-aged guy with no, he doesn't have a wife, there's no aunt there, his daughters are at boarding school. Uh, that's not a situation that, I mean, Jefferson's daughter would never be sent into a situation like that. If somebody said, oh, Martha, Patsy, you know, go stay with James Madison for, you know, three years in a house like that, you, it just wouldn't happen. Uh, and so there she is. So we think about, you know, Captain Ramsey, then we think about Jefferson. This is his wife's half-sister. This is a person whom he owns at this point. This is someone he's known, I mean, known all of her life. Um, and the special situations, the vulnerabilities that, that she faced in those circumstances. Now, and here's the really tricky part, because, it, because she's in a place where she has an opportunity to be a free person and she thinks of herself as a free person and Jefferson thinks of them as free. He has a, Jefferson believed that France was like England actually was not, <laughs> because you know, free soil. Uh, he thinks that because they're there, that means that you're automatically free. And his thing was, well, you can't let people know. If, if, if you're interested in not having the slave claim freedom, you better hope they don't find out, because if they find out, then you, we have no power, I mean, to stop them from getting their freedom. Now, it's true, every petition that was filed um, for freedom in France uh, in the 18th century was granted. The ones in Paris, in other parts of France, it was not like that. But in Paris, everybody who filed a petition for freedom uh, was granted. She could have had freedom. And at some point, Madison Hemings said, she becomes Mr. Jefferson's concubine, uh, and when they're about to go home, the best thinking is this is something that would have happened. I mean, she gets pregnant near the end of their, her stay, so we don't really know. Nobody has any way of knowing when this got started, but it's we do know that this is for Madison Hemings and for things that happen once she gets back that she has a baby in 1790. Uh, this is a 17-year-old girl who decides that she wants to stay in Paris. Um, I don't think that she wanted to stay there by herself. She had her older brother who was there, who just before they leave hires a tutor to teach him French, which sort of indicates that he might have had some idea that he really wanted to stay there. So. I, I don't, he doesn't say this, Madison Hemings doesn't say this, but it's hard to believe that she, that this was just her, and, and James's actions suggest that he wanted to stay as well. And Jefferson persuades her to come home. Now, people ask me, so here's the, here's the real question. Can a 16 or 17 year old girl bargain with a middle-aged man? Uh, and there are people who say no that's not likely that could, something that can happen. And then people say, well, yeah, uh, she could bargain about that uh, because she's not in Virginia um, and she's in some place where she had an alternative. And then people say, well, you know, the French Revolution is breaking out. How likely is it could she have stayed? On the other hand, if you're 16 or 17 years old, you're not, I mean, you might think you can do anything. Um, so you have to, there's a lot to balance here. She, her situation is actually quite ambiguous. So you have, Sal, you have her mother who is with John Wales, and we have no indication what, what that's like. I mean, you know, that's, they got six kids together. This could be, you know, this is, we have, there's no reason to think that there's any affective connection there at all. There's no think that there, there's no, there could be no negotiating there because she's totally under his, his power. Um, we don't know what he thinks about her. The children are interesting because all of those names, I mean, I actually came over to, to the National Archives here to look up John Wales to try to figure out his story. He was born in Lancaster. So I ended up going to, the, to Preston, up to the Lancaster, Lancaster Records Office and also here, Sally Hemings, when I mean, we look at the Wales family, all of his children are named for his brothers and uncles. I mean, they're James, Sally, Robert, all those people, Wales, they're all up there in Lancaster, uh, his family. So the children he names after his family. 
we don't know what that means, that it means anything about his connection to, to Elizabeth. Um, so Sally Hemings, we have Jefferson who's in, the, and she and Jefferson are in this extraordinary situation where you could at least talk about how viable Madison Hemings' statement. He, he describes the um, agreement between his mother and father as a treaty. And we were free according to this treaty. Um, and so he makes it a contractual kind of thing that's, uh, that um, deter that sets her, the terms of her engagement, uh, of terms of engagement for her returning to Monticello. Um, your children will be free at 21. If you have any kids, they'll be free at 21, and you will be have a good life at Monticello. Uh, that's what Madison Heming says Jefferson tells her, uses to persuade her to come back. And if people have asked me, you know, well, you know, what does that mean? Like, <laughs> you know, what, what do I think? Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of reasons she could come back. The, the dilemma of leaving your family, leaving your mother, leaving your, your relatives um, behind while you seek freedom. Um, when enslaved women ran away in America, they very often, most often ran with their children, meaning they more often got caught <laughs> because, than males because they were trying to get everybody together and they're more leaving children behind. It's a tough thing because women are socialized, even in slavery, women, even in, I mean, insulin, women are socialized to take care of family. And so it would not surprise me at all if a good part of this was not, oh, Jefferson, I want to come back with you, is I don't want to leave my mother. I don't want to leave my sisters and my brothers. I don't want to leave my family. And if you promise me, and Madison Hemming said she relied on Jefferson, on his promises on which she implicitly re relied, which is another thing that gives people problems. Making why would he? Why would she trust him? And I think there, it could be the way she treated her brothers and her family up until that point. You remember I suggested that they are not. What's going on in this particular, with these particular group of people, is separate from what's going on with Jefferson and other people at, at Monticello. Her brothers hired them themselves out hired their own time, even though it was against the law to do it, and kept their own money. I mean, lots of times he didn't know where they were. So he had treated them in a way that might make her think he was going to do what he said. So she comes back. So you have Jefferson and Sally Hemings, again, more a bit more information than you have about uh, Elizabeth and, and, and John Wales. Then there's Sally Hemings' older sister, Mary, who, when Jefferson goes to Paris, is leased out to uh, a man named Thomas Bell in Charlottesville um, as a housekeeper. And while she's there, they began a relationship. Again, how do you des describe these things? I mean, he's the, the less, you know, he's the lessor. He's leasing her from Jefferson. And they have two children uh, together. And when Jefferson comes back, she asks Jefferson to sell her to Thomas Bell, which he does. And they live on Main Street in Charlottesville. Uh, Thomas Bell dies in the beginning of um, uh, the 1800s. And he leaves the property to her, the house and land to her and their children. He frees the children. He doesn't free her. He doesn't free her, and you're sort of thinking, what's up with that? Uh, you free the children, you leave her property. You can't really leave slaves' property because slaves can't own property, but again, it shows you how law on the ground actually works. People in that community understood who she was, and his relatives understood who she and so nobody challenges this. They just kind of go along with it because they understand who she is. She calls herself... Uh, Mary Bell, um, people who write recollections of Monticello write of her as Mary Bell, uh, and they refer to her as the common law wife of of, um, of Thomas Bell. But this is in the late 1900s. But you know she can't be a common law wife because she can't have been a wife. You know, I mean the common law established establishing 
you know, that it's like, like a marriage, but marriages between white people and black people were against the law um, in Virginia up until 1967. Uh, and uh, so, but that's in their understanding, common law wife, that's, that's who she was, and people accepted that. So, Mm -hmm. um, when Thomas Bell dies and um, she remains a slave, who owns her? Well, technically some one of his relatives should have owned her, but nobody ever, he had no, he had no children, he had no legal children, he had no wife, so it would have been like a collateral, like a brother or an uncle or someone like that, but nobody ever claimed ownership of, of her or claimed ownership of his property, and he did in fact have relatives. Uh, white relatives, but it was just, I mean, people just let it go. That he explained to him, he suggests that he explained to his relatives that he was... That he, he could well have done that. I mean, the ground yeah, so that yeah, that this is, you know, we know who she is. He didn't have a wife. See, the people who typically do this kind of thing are people who don't have, I mean, they're, they're going through a lot of wills now in in Albemarle County, and they're finding a number of wills where guys will say, "I'm freeing my mulatto slave or whatever, you know, or my slave, you know, Jane and her three children." And it's not he's not saying these are my children, but it's kind of suspicious. It's some person who's not married, uh, has been living with this person. They've got the kids. And so there's more of that. We used to think that the stereotype is that, you know, in French slavery, French fathers were much more likely to leave property to their children. And they certainly left, I mean, there are slave plantations in, in, um, in, in, in Louisiana where people, they left <coughs> plantations, huge numbers of slaves to mixed race kids. Don't see that very much in Virginia. But these small landholders, there's more of this than, I guess, more of this than we, we think of. Because people think about a law on the books. But it's not until you actually get down into the primary sources. And that means you've got to read all of the wills, which is a lot of work to do. A lot of people don't want to do that. It's much easier to look at what the statute says and then extrapolate from that. But the people who are actually doing the work suggest that there's more of it going on. And so, you know, there technically somebody could have come and said, you know, I, I claim this person, not the kids, because he actually does free them. Um, but he doesn't, but he gives her uh, the property. Uh, and, uh, and then later on, they, you know, take some of it. They take it as well from, from her. It's just people letting it go. It's just like uh, the uh, statute that required, uh, 1806 statute that required black people and free people to leave the state uh, unless they got permission uh, to remain in Virginia. Um, a lot of people filed for, um, you know, for permission and got it, and a lot of people didn't. And it just depended. If their neighbors, you know, didn't like them, <laughs> they might complain about it. If they didn't care, they just let them, you know, most people don't get involved in stuff unless there's a real problem. Mary Hemings and Thomas Bell did not, Mary Hemings and, well actually, Mary Hemings' daughter, children um, um, didn't, you know, Mary Hemings later on starts a, a relationship with another person um, and they don't get into trouble until they try to buy property together. As long as they were sort of living, if you were living together and didn't try to act like you were a real family, or didn't do things that suggested that you were a real family. In, in Albemarle, at least where Jefferson lived, people pretty much left folks alone. So it's law on the books versus what the community, law on the ground, where the community really determines how, how, the, law will be, how the law will be enforced. So we look at Mary Hemings. It's a different situation than Sally Hemings, but we do have her there asking to be sold to this guy um, and, you know, he couldn't, Thomas Bell could not make Jefferson sell, do that. You know, he said Jefferson owned Mary Hemings. Uh, she wants to live with this guy. So what am I to make of that? I mean, he never freed her, but he left her property and acknowledged her kids, and she takes his last name. And she clearly, from their actions, 
thinks of herself as married to this guy. But he owned her. So that's the only thing that I'm thinking here is that in some places you had to pay a bond. You had to pay uh, if you wanted to free a slave. Maybe they didn't want to do that, like a tax to do it. The other thing is how could a man, a black woman and a white man live together and fornicate, which was against the law, unless they were in a master and slave relationship. That's the only kind of thing that could cover it. Uh, because if she's property in that sense, nobody's coming in and saying, you know, you can't, they didn't, they didn't do that. You didn't interfere. You interfered with white women. If white women had children with, with black men, that was a completely different situation. They could be outlawed. I mean, you know, you could be killed, outlawed, without anybody um, being punished for it. You could be banished. Um, but people didn't bother white men in their relationships with, with, with black women. So that's really, that it could be a cover that that's the only reason. So you have, again, another permutation on all of this. Um, a woman who wants to be sold to a guy because she evidently has a plan of action about how she's going to constitute her family. And that plan of action ends up benefiting her family because later on, when Jefferson dies bankrupt and slaves have to be sold, they use, they borrow on the house to purchase relatives. Um, and that's how some of the, the enslaved people at Monticello are, are freed. Some of her, her brothers who are, not, who are not Wales children, but other uh, their uh, half-brothers, siblings, get freed um, because they have, um, because of the property that she got from Thomas Bell is used to, you know, to, to purchase their freedom. So you have her. So these are, and then the final person is, is Harry. Well, there are other members, other women who have, um, uh, other women in the Hemings family who would serve as examples of, of, of how enslaved women went through slavery. But then we have Harriet Hemings, Sally Hemings' daughter, uh, with Jefferson, who at age 21 is freed informally by Jefferson. She leaves with her older brother, Beverly, and goes to Washington. Uh, to start a life as a white woman, and we have no idea who she is, or what you know, who her family is, and what what's happened to them because they took new identities. Periodically, people show up claiming to be um, the descendants of Harriet, sort of like you know, Anastasia. You remember the the woman, the person who claimed to be the princess, whatever. Uh, and, but we haven't been able to track her down, but she has to, Je she's the only woman that Jefferson ever freed um, because he didn't, well, I would not have believed women should be free, uh, but he had to free her because if she had a child in slavery, even if she, even though she was by Virginia law white, because the law at that time was if you were seven eighths white, you were white, meaning a quote-unquote octoroon was a white person. That's in contravention of the one-drop rule. Um, but Jefferson believed a person who was seven-eighths white, and this was Virginia law, if they were freed, they were free white citizens of the United States. So in his view, his children were free white citizens of the United States. Um, the latter two, the last two, Madison and Eston, he formally freed, and they took care of their mother, who was in, not freed, uh, but was informally freed. Uh, and people ask about, well, what's, what's up with that? Um, did she, when she's bargaining, is she bargaining for her freedom or is she bargaining for the freedom of her children? Um, it's evidently the freedom of her children. Uh, Jefferson, well, first place, she's, what, she was at the time in her 50s when he uh, died. Um, you couldn't free a slave who was below 21 or above 45 in Virginia without explaining how you were going to take care of them, because they didn't, they weren't they didn't want to, people to be a you know a ward of the state. Uh, the state have to care for people, so he would have had to say, you know, I'm freeing Sally Hemings. Ask the legislature to allow her to remain in Virginia and here's how I'm going to take care of for the rest of her life. He was not going to do that. He was never going to do that and did not do that. 
And I don't think he would have thought that women should be freed. I mean, Jefferson had a real issue with women in the sense of, well, the patriarch, uh, that freeing a woman, if freeing a 50-year-old woman would not have been something that he thought to do, uh, even though that may have been what she wanted. But in any event, she ends up in a census of 1830 as a free white woman. And then another census, 1833, when they go around and ask people if they want to go back to Africa, uh, uh, enslaved people, free blacks, if they want to go back to Africa, they ask her if she wants to go back to Africa, and she says no. Uh, why would she want to go back to Africa? But she's listed there as a free, she's a colored person at that point, or Negro, I think she may have been called at this point. So she, her ending is ambiguous. Her children's um, ending is pretty clear. I mean, if in fact she did bargain with him, if that bargaining with him in, in uh, 1789 uh, resulted in her four children uh, going free when they were adults and getting a 40-year head start on, on emancipation. And that's the main point of Madison Hemings' recollections. What he's trying to, to show is what his mother had done for him. Now, I thought about all of this, um, again, watching this movie the other night. Uh, you know, what kind of strategies, what, is that any form of that dread word agency? I mean, people think about sexual power. Is sexual power really a form of power? Um, is it, you know, how are we supposed to think about this? Because I've been talking about this now for many years, and any time I go around, the one question people always ask me, I've never given any talk anywhere where people don't ask me, did they love each other? And I'm thinking, what is that, you know, what is that about? Why is that important? And I, I suppose it's important for people because they want to have some sense, well, what is, do they love each other? Is that about authenticity? Do people want authenticity in the connection? Does it change how people think about Jefferson? Does it change how we think about her? Um, and, you know, what I remember uh, reading an, an article, a review actually, of, of my book and and saying, well, Annette Gordon-Reed doesn't want to talk about rape. Well, you know, I do talk about rape. I talk about rape quite a bit. I mean, how do you, you know, what do we think this is? Is it, is it like a situation where you say that because people cannot con refuse consent, then it's always rape? Uh, if a person can't say no, how can you get a viable consent? How can you know that a person actually wants to, you know, to be in a kind of connection with somebody? On the other hand, does it matter? And we think about Sally Hemings. She's it's it's the perfect. I mean, in, in the book, I, I contrast her situation uh, with her sister Mary and a woman named Celia, who's another famous um, enslaved woman who, in Missouri in the 1850s, killed her master. Uh, Martha Jones is doing a, a uh, I think they're doing a big project about this, the Celia Project. This woman who killed her master after years of sexual abuse. He buys her and basically rapes her on the way home. I mean, he clearly is buying her for sexual uh, gratification. Rapes her on the way home from the auction um, and for two years basically rapes her. And she, at one point, um, he comes to, he says he's coming to visit her and she threatens him and he comes anyway and she kills him. Uh, hitting him over the head with part of a tree branch and then burns his body in the fireplace and then the next morning asks his grandson says you know I got a lot of ashes in my um, fireplace here would you help me dispose of them and the kid says yes and basically helps her dispose of the, of the bodies of his granddad now there's no doubt how she felt about him I mean, there's no ambiguity here. So you look at Celia, and then you look at Mary Hemings, and you look at Sally Hemings, and you look at someone like you know, Mary, like Elizabeth, and then back way back to the unknown African woman. 
And these are all, are these all the same situations, different situations? We have to think about how to write about them because they're all women who are slaves and their sexual, and sex becomes a mechanism. I mean, their, their connection to men is, uh, well, well, not for Celia because, you know, obviously nothing, her children don't derive any benefit um, from their connection to Robert Newsom. Um, but all of these other women seem to be, at some point, all their children end up in a better, a different situation than other enslaved people because of this kind of connection. So how do, it's a very fraught thing because you don't want to, I mean, I, I don't mind talking about rape, but my, I'm enough of, I don't like blanket statements that all, I don't believe all of anybody ever always does anything. And it's difficult to try to sort out how to portray these things. There's the political view, it's just like a minor. You know, sex with somebody below the age, what's the age of consent in England? What, what would it be? 16, yeah. Um, sex with somebody 16 and below is rape, period. Well, it's not really the way it's handled in law because it depends as well on various. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. well, it depends on how. The age gap that there might be between mm -hmm. the. Yeah, yeah, they have. They have more yeah, they have the Romeo Juliet uh, yeah. exception kind of thing where somebody's 18 versus somebody's a senior in college versus somebody who's a freshman or whatever. But I mean, you know, but a cutoff, a strict cutoff position. Mm -hmm. For that, so with Sally Hemings, with Mary Hemings is easier because Mary Hemings is in her twenties, late twenties, early yeah, no, she's actually in her thirties when Jefferson comes back and she says, "I want to live with Thomas Bell," and moves in with him and then sort of takes over his household or whatever, and then ends up taking over his property. Sally Hemings, sixteen or seventeen years old. And of course, age and consent things don't matter at this point because the age of consent then was 10. Uh, and they raised it to 12 in the 1820s. So, I mean, they had a different understanding about when people could consent uh, to sex at that time period. But there's still the question of his ownership of her. But then there's the question of they're in France and she's someplace where she thinks she's, well, she's a free person. She's not by herself and she's with a brother who's about 26. So could she have said no to him? Could she have had a recourse? How likely is it? Does where she is matter uh, when you think about her? Uh, what does it do to Celia's situation if I say that someone like Mary Hemings, who was owned by you know, Thomas Bell every bit as much as Robert Newsom owned Celia, do I make light of Celia's situation, if I say that a person who wants to be sold to a guy, I mean, if there was any, it's pretty clear, if she'd had any shot in the world of getting the heck away from Robert Newsom, Celia would have taken it. <laughs> you know, she would have gone, she would have been out of there. Versus someone who says, I want to go live with somebody. But then you have this other person who says, I want to come back home, but is she coming back home because she likes because she feels any kind of affinity for him or is she coming home because this is where her family is and she trusts him enough at least to, that he's going to do what he said he's going to do when he did um, but she doesn't know that uh, at the time period are those situations the same so it's a complicated matter uh, again back to this film I mean this portrayal of this this woman and making it okay by suggesting that you know, she's going to get something out of that. Does that lessen, does in any way lessen the kind of exploitative nature of, of the lives of African-American women or, or enslaved women in all slave cultures? So with that, I think I should, I've been droning on. I should stop. Go ahead.